Well, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you along. My name's Harry Henderson, and uh, tonight's webinar is uh, tyres, traction and compaction. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try and cram as much information uh, into, uh, into this webinar as we can. We've got about an hour, which is going to be a, 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 a tall order. Now, if you can go to the, the next slide, Stephen. Um, just some housekeeping rules, really. Um, you're all set to uh, mute, and we can't hear you. We can't see you, which may be a good thing. Um, and uh, we'll, if you do have some questions, there's a, a, a text box on the right-hand side that you can ask questions um, as, as we go through. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the at the end. Uh, basis points are available. Um, please enter your name and postcode and basis number in the question box, and then we can take it forward from there. And, uh, and this webinar will be recorded. Uh, we'll put it on our uh, YouTube channel uh, in, in the next few days. And so if you miss anything or if you think it's worth listening to again or recommend it to somebody, then uh, they can pick it up at, uh, at YouTube. Um, <clears throat> There's the other uh, the previous webinars can be found there as well, and there's quite a quite a selection on uh, on online available for you. Um, after the uh, the webinar's finished, you'll be taken to a survey uh, at the end of end of the uh, the session. Um, so any feedback on the quality of the of the transmission um, connection and that sort of thing. And if it's what you want to hear more of or what you want to hear less of, um, please help us uh, uh, by filling in the the, um, the survey and uh, we can take it from there. Next slide, Stephen, I think. Um, so what we did really, we ran a tyres, traction and compaction set of road shows where from Berwick upon Tweed to south of Berwick, right down to Devon and across the Bedfordshire, we ran these uh, these uh, events, and um, it was an idea that we mused on. And we, I, I spoke to a few farmers, and they said, "Well, yeah, no, it'd be interesting to get to get involved with tyres." And I said, "What tyres have you got on your tractor?" And he says, "Well, <clears throat> radials, or are they craft tyres? I don't know." So we thought, right, okay, that's that's enough feedback for me. Let's run a uh, tyres traction compaction uh, road show. We contacted uh, most of the uh, the tyre manufacturers. Some guys couldn't can't get to commit the people to do it. Um, some guys weren't didn't feel it was for them. Um, so Bridgestone and uh, Verdistein came forward and said, "Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll share the honours um, with you." And uh, and so we were lucky to get Stephen Lamb from Bridgestone and John Cottrell from Verdistein to to help out. Um, and in the photograph you can see there, this was uh, down in Hereford phoned a local dealer said could we borrow your demo tractor yeah no problem john cottrell turns up with his way cells and this was at hereford race course and you can see the the audience there um just understanding the the way off for the front and rear axles of the tractor so um it worked very well so this webinar really is a, is a rounding off um a catch-all for anyone that missed the the road show and to uh, to to get a gist of what we're we're doing Generally, these meetings are over two and a half hours long, so we, we're tight for time. We're just going to try and get finished by eight o'clock or thereafter uh, tonight. So uh, we've got a, we're a, lot, a lot to get through. We found it's a broad topic. Um, there's an awful lot of applications and um, conversations that we had. So it's a lot to get into. Um, but one of the key things really is, is uh, our uh, independence. Um, the uh, um, the, uh, the AHDB is, is an independent organisation, so we're not aiming to, um, to, uh, to um, uh, sell one tyre or the other, but we do have to uh, engage with um, tyre manufacturers and Bridgestone and the guys that have, have come forward. Other tyres are available and, uh, and Stephen will uh, present the, the, his case really as, a, as an independent as he, as he possibly can. Um, so yeah, go on to the next next slide, or next and yeah, independence and the next one, Stephen. So it'll be a broad topic. Got a lot to get in. Um, we've got about two hours worth of information to get to cram into about fifty minutes, really. So Stephen, I've got a, a 
a quite a, um, a job to do. So Stephen Lamb from Bridgestone, we've seen the photographs on the previous slide of us both. Um, so um, if you if you see him, but the the one thing that we want to get across is, from this webinar is an appreciation of the tyres that you have on your tractor now and how you can get more from them. And I think that would be true of any tri manufacturer would dearly love um, operators and the owners of tyres to, to get more from them. And when you're in the market for your next tractor, can you go back to your dealer and just say, what is available? What If I've got this specific job to do, what is available and 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 how can we uh, we pair up the tyres? Dealers are usually pretty pretty resourceful. They can kit out a tractor with, with whatever tyres you really like, as long as you're armed with the information. And, uh, and this is what this webinar is all about. So without further ado, really, I'd like to introduce Stephen Lamb. Um, he'll be the voice you'll hear for the next next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so. And if you had have any burning questions, we can interrupt Stephen. But as I say, there'll be a uh, question and answer session at the end. So um, over to you, Stephen. Right. Thank you, Harry. And good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk to you about these black and round things, these tyres that we all see and, and um, for a long time we've probably overlooked. Hopefully it'll be very informative. We have got a lot of content to go through, but hopefully you can take away a couple of snippets that you will be able to use back on the farm. And I hope it, this is of some interest. The aim of this evening is to give you some informative information on all things tyre related in order that you can get the very best not only out of your tyres but also out of your tractor but while at the same time caring for your soil. The areas we're going to be looking at this evening are tyre choice and that's very very important that's one of the key messages for this evening that you do have tyre choice and what are those tyre choices. We're going to look, because we're talking about so, uh, soil compaction, we're looking at generation three. Hopefully some of you will have heard of it, a VF tyre, which is a field based tyre. We'll have a little session on soil compaction and the importance of the square inch, as I call it. Talking about tyre management on the, on the back of that and in balance with that, a balanced tractor, where we're talking about weight distribution, the pressure and the weight distribution in order to get an effective tractor. And like Harry says at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. I'm from sales. I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. Uh, if they're a bit, little bit more in-depth or specific, uh, we may have to go back to our technical team and come back to you um, shortly after that. OK, tyre choice. This is the big thing. There is now a choice and you want to be aware in the marketplace, there's a vast number of sizes that are constantly coming to the marketplace. And within those sizes, there's also various options available to you in the marketplace. Take our good selves on a 710 7042. We don't just now produce one of those tyres, we produce four different ones, be it a price, position, or a specific uh, specification application that you're after. So all of a sudden, within a tyre size, you do have a choice there. And this is all about getting the very best experience from your tractor. As you can see, we've got a few initials here. The first one in red, standard tyre. That's a standard tyre that we all know on the farm, generally a radial drive tyre, d &E rated. We've got a tyre called an IF and a VF, CFO, and then at the bottom, a road tyre that's coming more and more prominent, which you might say is a multi-purpose tyre between field, but a lot of benefits and emphasis on road going. The main one we'll be talking about this evening is VF. Um, on the road shows that we've carried out with Harry, it's been surprising ourselves. We've been around in the market for five years now and our good friends, Mr. Mitchell, in something like 10 years with the VF offering. And yet when we ask people to put their hands up who've heard of the VF uh, specification, it's around about 5% of the audience. So clearly we're not quite getting the message over, uh, but hopefully this evening we'll have some more followers or some more farmers that will be aware that that specification is out there. And if it's a field-based tyre that you're after, that may well be the tyre that you should be looking towards. I've got just a couple of slides before we go on to that. And one is CFO, cyclic field operation. This is sometimes called cyclic harvest operation. And this is a tyre for the types of applications you can see there, where we're looking at a tyre that is loaded, then unloaded, loaded and unloaded. So effectively, we're stressing, de-stressing, stressing, and then de-stressing the tyre again, rather than it being under constant stress. And by having that on and off stress um, with cyclic load, um, operation it does give us a bonus as you can see at the bottom against a standard IF tyre versus an IF CFO so if we've got a combine say that's coming down the road and the tyre is capable of 10 tonne 
which it can carry, when it goes into the field and the tank's full and the header's on, all of a sudden it's able to carry 15 and a half tonne. So this may well be a tyre that would be uh, specific to some of your applications. Cyclic field operation is the specification of the tyre. And the other slide I want to go on to now, which is coming more and more, we've just launched one now, a VX tyre. Uh, for field and road, but it has got lots of specifications for road and Mr. Mitchell and with their road bib equally coming out where you're doing a eight, 70, 80, 90 percent of road work. And these are the areas in red that you should be looking towards when you're looking for a road going tyre. So high high speeds rated, high carrying capacity for productivity, a good lug to give you wear, high wear capacity lug, lug rubber as well, a good lug design to give you plenty of overlap in terms of ride comfort, driver fatigue and also stability and also what we need in this day and age where we're carrying much heavier loads at faster speeds and potentially going down potholes or road debris on a really good robust carcass. So when you are, if you are in the market for a road going tyre, look for those types of uh, benefits and features and that will put you in good stead. But the one this evening that we're going on to and concentrating on is a VF tyre, generation three as we call it, and its benefits. There's a picture of the tyre itself. VF, what does it stand for? Very high flexion or very high flexation as I call it. And the specification of the tyre is it's a more resilient or resistant carcass than a corresponding standard tyre. And it also operates, as you can see there, with a great deal of deflection. Uh, down at the bottom there, and that is how it's have to operate. If you're unfamiliar with it, you'll be somewhat concerned about that. You'll probably think it's overloaded or underinflated, but that is how it's designed to operate with a big bulge at the bottom of the tyre. And one of the nice things about this is also at the bottom, as you see there, is it can operate with no adjustment to inflation pressure, both in the field and on the road. So if your load is the same, both in the field and on the road, you don't have to be having to change your pressures to get the benefit out of the tyre. Let's have a look at the specifications of tyre now. And as you can see, we've got a generation one tyre, which is a standard tyre that we all know, D&E. And then we've got a generation two tyre, which is an IF tyre, improved flexion. And then generation three, the tyre which we're going to be talking about specifically this evening, VF tyre, very high flexation. And what we rather than thinking is it IF or VF or standard, if we just call it a generation one, a generation two and a generation three, I think most people understand if you've got iPhones or iPads, the higher the number in the generation, the very latest technology you've got. And the very latest technology out there is generation three VF tyre. So we can say, what is the benefit to our good cells? Well, between one and two, you get a 20% benefit. Yes, that's 20%. And would you believe between generation two and generation three, you get a further 20%. They're big numbers in agriculture. So if you was to go from a standard tyre, generation one, up to a generation three, that would be 40%, 40% benefit by just changing the specification of the tyre to generation three. And that is huge. If I could save you 40% on fuel, or if I could increase your crop yield by 40%, you'd think I was a miracle worker. But these tyres are available out there for you now for the 40% benefit. And generally, it's at this point that the audience say, well, what's the benefit to me? And that's on the next slide. So what is the actual benefit? Well, it goes one of two ways. We can either increase the payload capacity by 40%. So if we're getting a little bit illegal, we're putting an extra furrow on the plough or we're getting an extra metre width of working um, power harrow working widths uh, and we're getting a little bit illegal, we can increase the carrying capacity by 40%. So if we have a tractor, say on the rear axle, the pressure is at 20 PSI and it can carry 10 tonne, all of a sudden, by changing it to a generation three, we can still carry 20, sorry, still at 20 PSI, but we can carry 14 tonnes and we can come road legal. So that's one area that you can go. And the other area of benefit, which most people will want, is a reduction in pressure by 40%. So again, you've got the tyre there at 20 PSI carrying 10 tonne. You can still carry a 10 tonne, but from, instead of 20, you're down to 12 PSI per square inch. That's 8 PSI every square inch that you have reduced on, on that tyre. Phenomenal. How does it do it? Well, it's not rocket science. Um, if you look there, we've got widths of 50, uh, sorry, 650 widths going along there. If we were to put a balloon on a table or onto a floor, it would make a, a roundy sort of shape. On a standard tyre, 650, 85, 38 there, as you can see, it's a roundy, boxified type of footprint that it'd make. 
but with the VF tyre, as you can see there, it's much lot more elongated front to rear. So it's still at 650 wide, but the tyre itself is elongated, much more oval in it. And by being oval, it, um, it allows you to have the greater carrying capacity or what most people want, running at a lower pressure. So if you can understand the principle between the two, a standard tyre in the old days, they would say three lugs on the ground. With a VF, we're talking around about four lugs on the ground. So if you understand that principle, we've got a bigger footprint, but the footprint is not wider, it's longer front and rear in order to gain the benefits that we just spoke about. So if you can remember that. And this is just showing here uh, the tire itself, good strong bead area for an anchor point and then up in the shoulder area, another strong anchor point and at the side wall, got lots of flexing going on there. Let's have a look now at the benefits, the benefits of the IF and VF of, of that over a standard tyre in terms of what we've just been speaking about in terms of load and pressure. And here we have um, pressure charts, which I'm, all, I'm sure you're all familiar with. I think that was yes. Um, and they're all the same tyre, but as you can see, there are 710, 7042. The top one is the Generation 1. Then you've got Generation 2 IF and at the bottom, um, VF generation three and one of the things hopefully you can see or realize is in terms of adjustments on a standard tire you've got something like I believe it's something like 62 potential adjustments that you can make and if you remember on one of the opening statements I said there's no adjustment between field and road on the bottom one the VF one you can see there's there's just 16 adjustments so the beauty about that if you do regularly change your pressures in that regard you're going to change them less often potentially and if you don't change your pressures at all, there's more chance you're going to be nearly correct than not. So let's have a look at the scenario here of more load. As you can see on each of the tyres, I've put a pink line across there, which represents 50k speed going along of each of the tyres. And the farmer said wants to run at one bar and he's asking what can he carry? Well, at one bar, 14 and a half PSI, generation one tyre there, you can see over the tyre it's 4.2 tonne that it will carry under that condition generation two comes up to 4.8 and with the generation three tyre it's 5.6 uh, 5 so all of a sudden same speed same pressure but a greater carrying capacity we'll look now at less pressure and what I've had to do here is put them in in terms of the load that it's carrying to the nearest box uh, that I can do. So again, we've got 12, uh, 50, 50K, sorry, all in pink going across there. And in generation one to carry 6.8 tonne um, going across, you'll see there we've got an inflation pressure of 2.4 bar. And then we come down to generation two at 6.9, slight increase, and that's reduced down to 1.8 bar. And finally, the VF, it's about half a ton extra across the axle, but it's the nearest I could get at, at seven ton per tire, and that's 1.4 bar. So as you can see, similar carrying capacity, same speed, but instead of being generation one at 2.4, we're now down to 1.4. 14 or 14 and a half PSI in every square inch less we have reduced simply by going from generation one to generation three, and that is same load, less pressure. Quick question here now is, how do I know whether my tire is a VF specification or indeed an IF specification? It's fairly straightforward. Go up to your track to look at the sidewall where the size is. And if it's got anything in front of the 710 like we have here, that's got VF, we know that that tire is of a, of a VF specification. And equally, if it had IF in front of it, you would know that as well. All documentation, invoices, data books should have that if you're dealing with that specification of tyre. So if it's got in the front there, VF, you know that's the tyre that we're dealing with as opposed to a standard generation one tyre. Compaction and the square inch. Um, very important, I think, as we go through it now, understanding, forget a little bit about tyres and tyre sizes. Let's just concentrate on the basics, that square inch. If we can control that square inch, and as I say in Yorkshire, look after the pennies and the pounds will naturally look after themselves. Everything else will, therefore, will follow thereafter. And by that, what I mean is the square inch we should focus in on is in order to minimise the, um, uh, the effect of uh, soil compaction from your tractor and the load that it's carrying. Don't initially look at the tyre size that you want, have that in the background, but try and look for which is the lowest operating pressure tyre that you can actually run. And also what's the narrowest width that you can run. Yeah. So we're looking for the lowest PSI and at the narrowest tyre. 
but it has to be obviously applicable to the job in hand. Clearly, we're not going to go ploughing with a narrow row crop tyre, but there is movement within there now that we've got this choice that we're aware of. And if you were to take a strip, a one inch strip, as we've got here across the width of the tyre, and in this case, it's a 650, and that would be 25 inches there. So we've got 25 inches across the width of the tyre and use that as the barometer. For the, every square inch, we can reduce the value in that, be it 20 PSI, 19 PSI, 12 PSI. We can reduce that down. We will reduce the potential of soil compaction. And also, if we can re reduce the width from not 25 inches across the tyre, but maybe to 24 or 23 or even 22, if that's possible. Again, we will reduce the, the impact of soil compaction. So always think about that square inch, and that's probably one of your governing factors that you go for. And then from there, look at the tyre and the tyre size that's applicable. Square inch is a key thing. And what I mean by that is we've got two tyres, as you can see here, uh, 650, 6542, brand Y, brand X, and they're carrying four ton, and both of them would be uh, 20 PSI. So apart from a brand preference or maybe a price position, both those tyres would do the self same job. And then we talked about reducing the pressure. And as you can see, we've changed brand Y to a VF specification, still carrying the same load, but instead of being 20, it's now down to 12 PSI. Every square inch that comes in contact or your tyre in contact with that soil has reduced its impact by 8 PSI. And let's look about now, we said the narrowest tyre. And if it's possible, instead of, as you can see there, 650, you've got to a 620, 7042. And we've still got the, the pressure at 12. And yeah, 650, 620, approximately about an inch width less that we're coming in. So we're just narrowing it by a, an inch. And people would say, well, that's not a lot. And it isn't a lot. It doesn't sound a lot. But let's just see how lot that is. If we look at this slide here, where we say we've got one inch less of width of tyre. You can see the size of the field that we've got there and the pass width of uh, six metres. One pass of that rear tyre would be uh, 87 rotations. And to do the whole field, we'd have to do 33 uh, passes, i.e. 2,871 rotations. One rotation of the tyre or its rolling circumference of that inch strip would be 225 inches. So if you divide that by or times that rather by the number of rotations, you come up with a quite a bit large figure of 646,000 square inches, which is quite high. Now, because we've removed that, but originally we, we had it in place within that square inch that now we've removed was 20 PSI, 20 pounds in every one of those square inches. And that means effectively by going from 650 down to 620, we've got something like 13 million pounds less potential, and I say potential, load that we're not imparting on the ground. And it's the old adage, if you don't put it in there, you don't have to take it out in terms of uh, time, fuel, uh, air wear and tear on your tractor, expensive metal parts, tines and points, et cetera, et cetera. And because also you're not putting it in there, uh, your plant, your root growth, et cetera, that's going to benefit from that. So just by one inch, that would be the difference. And it's quite substantial, as no doubt you would uh, agree, just one inch by moving it in and reducing the uh, uh, the effect of soil compaction. Oh, Lord. So there we have it. We've come in narrower slightly, and because we've gone onto a VF specification, we've reduced the pressure. So we've reduced the pressure, and we've also gone for a slightly narrower tyre. In terms of uh, tyres and widths, reductions and duels, we can go on a little bit further now, and that will also give us some benefits. Um, as you can see, because we've got this choice now of generation one, two, and three, we don't necessarily need to go to a wider tyre. Like in the old days, we're from 600, 650s, 710s, 800s, 900s. Why did we do that? Because we only had one generation of tyre, because either we wanted to carry a heavier load or we wanted to reduce our um, pressure, our soil compaction. But now, with having this choice, we don't necessarily have to do that in order to increase either our carrying capacity or reduce the pressure applied to the soil by utilising the benefit of that Generation 3 tyre. For the self-same tyre, if you remember back to the shape that we were looking at, we changed the shape, yeah, but we also increased the surface area. And this is an example here of what I'm talking about. If you had a tractor and you would put 800 6532s or maybe for doing umbilical cord work or whatever the reason why in the old days you did it because you wanted a bigger footprint the only way you could do that was go wider so that was 800 wide 
would you believe if you put a six a vf 650 65 42 that will carry actually slightly more load for the, exactly the same pressure so the question would be if you're making a a, a line with the tire down down the field why would you want to go to 800 when you could go at 650 and every square inch of the 650 is applying the same amount of load as what the 800 would be so again by changing the pressure changing the shape by change turning to around 90 degrees you can gain benefits there this is a quick chart just to show that um, generation one versus generation three all these tires here are at the same pressure at 23 psi and they are capable of doing 50k on the second column or row should i say that we talked about of 800 65 32 versus VF 650, 65, 42. You can see there, as I pointed out, the VF will actually carry a little bit more load. But if you said it was like for like, why would you want to go 800 wide when you could go at 650 and every square inch of the 650 was, was imparting the same pressure as an 800 one would do? So by just utilizing the benefits of the VF, you can actually come in, if it's available to you, come in narrower and still carry the same, same load at similar pressure. Um, this is an interesting chart here. This is um, tire width versus axle versus the implement width that you're going down three, four, five meters, and what that percentage tire contact area would be on the pass or indeed on the field itself. Um, just below, as you can see there in red, I've highlighted a 650 tire across the width of the axle that would be 1.3 meters. And if we had a six meter power hour or whatever, we would actually be contacting in that room within that field around about 20% contact of that field. Would, sorry, 20% of the field would be in contact with actually the tire. And as you can see there, when you go onto something like a sprayer at 32 inches, uh, 32 meters or sorry, pass, it brings the uh, percentage down greatly. Something maybe you want to think about when you're looking at 900s with them. Um, six meters and it's 30 percent contact with the with the ground but just a chart there just as a percentage of where your tires um, would come into play in terms of coverage on the field itself now here we've got jewels this is an interesting one i must say you need to do your homework first sorry i thought i had interruption there Becky, pardon um dual it's wheels it's steven yeah steven. sorry yeah Hang on. yeah just go back to the next slide um i was just going to just quiz you on uh, control traffic farming okay. so it's quite it's quite ah. an interesting chart in terms of yes. if you want to look at control traffic and you want to look at your your widths and your passes you can see there's a dramatic um reduction in the passes if you if you go down a control traffic Farming route. Yeah, it's very, yeah, it's very much if you look at that indication of going down the control traffic route where you're trying to cut down on the percentage of contact in the field, depending yeah. on your tire width and also the width of the implement that uh, you've got there. I would think yeah. if you can get to around about 20%, that would be good. And clearly, anything less would be would be a bonus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. an interesting chart that one. It's very yeah. good. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, and now we come on to this um, dual wheels. Um, if it's not for um, hillside st stability or consolidation that you're after, but it's purely for walking lightly on the ground, dual wheels, you have to do your homework and your sums. But there are occasions, again, by utilising the benefits of the VF. And here we've got dual wheels, 650, 65, 42. They're carrying eight tonne. And because of the formula you use, they would be all running at eight PSI. If you had the VF specification on there, still at eight, eight tons carrying capacity across the axle, but we would have to go up slightly to 12 PSI. So the question we pose here is, if we're putting tires on to walk lightly on the ground, which of those two do we think would walk lighter on the ground? Four at eight or two at 12? Interesting. Well, if we have a little graph here or um, surface area of both the tires together over one revolution, and as you can see on the left hand side there, we've got the VF at 12 PSI. Um, rolling circumference there, I've got down at 220. And because there's two tires together, that's 51 inches. That's the surface area that you would cover there, 11,220. And because we've got four tires, it's actually the same rolling circumference, of course, but it's twice the width at 100, 102. And there we've got 22440. But because we've got 12 PSI versus the eight, as you look down there, actually we're potentially applying less load by using the VF at a higher pressure, but half the surface area in contact with the ground than what you would with the jewels. 
Um, so it's quite interesting to see in this exercise, you're actually going to impart 33% more load that. You have to do your own work, like I say, and it doesn't work every time. And the differentiation between the 8 and the 12, I believe if it was 8 and 14 PSI, you'd actually find that the jewels would be in, it would be in favour of the jewels. But it's a worthwhile exercise. And if it does work out, then it's better to use the VF tyre, single fitment. You don't have to be mucking around going through narrow gate holes or actually fitting and, and unfitting the jewels at the time. So an, an interesting exercise. It doesn't work all the time, but it's something to think about by utilising that, that VF benefit. This is yet another interesting chart, and this is the, the difference or the reduction in load that can be potentially applied. If we want to use the second row, again, our, fifth, our uh, popular 650, 65, 42, you can see the width of the tyre there is 25, and the roller circumference this time is 223. The surface area is that, and then if you say across the axle, which is double, you've got 11,150. If we put one PSI in every square inch of that, Clearly, it would be 1, 000, sorry, 11,150. With the Generation 1 tyre at 20 PSI, that would be uh, 223,000 pounds potential load over one revolution of the axle. But with the Generation 3 at reduced pressure of 12, as you can see there, you would actually be at the end. The difference between the two is nearly 90,000 pounds less just by using that benefit. And all those columns are a reduction by going from Gen 1 to Gen 3. One of the questions we started to answer, or ask, should I say, the audience, from my point of view, it was interesting from my point of view, as we went round on the, um, the seminars with Harry and his colleagues, was you guys out there, you'll know your field size, you know the soil type, the soil help, I assume, potentially what yield you would expect, depending on variety and what type of growing season it's been, but you would definitely know the potential time uh, it would take to do some ploughing or drilling within that specific field and how much fuel you would use. And you would certainly know um, the volume of fertiliser and chemicals you would use in, within the field. But one of the questions that we, I was asking or posing was, do we know how much potential soil compaction we would actually make? We know a lot of values, but do we know one of the, um, the enemies, if you like, to our profitability, compaction? Have we got a figure or have we got anything on that that we can actually say, well, yeah, I actually know roughly, or I know X, Y, and Z, and a lot of the audience said no. But one of the areas we can look at, and it isn't soil compaction, as a lady um, kindly told me at one of the seminars, but it is the force that's been applied to the, the soil that will thus create compaction. So we can use it as a value to have an indication of potential, how much compaction we'll get, depending on soil type density and moisture level. If we take a field here, and again, um, 300 by 200. And we do the calculation as we go along there, the tractor again, the old 650, 65, 42, we know it's 1.3 meters wide across the axle. Again, we've got six, six meter drill. We divide that, we know it's 33.3 uh, recurring passes to cover the field. And with the width of the tire, again, we know it's 43 meters wide of the 200 meters width of the field and therefore as we just pointed out earlier on 22 percent of that width of the field will the tire will come in contact with and then the length of the field if we times that by that and then turn it into inches because pounds per square inch is a nice one to for us to work out as opposed to bar we will find the surface area that we're covering there is 20 million square inches that the tire will come in contact with that field to do that work so if we were to say within that field that we're using a tire that's 20 psi, we would know potentially, potentially 100, 400 million rather pounds of a load would be applied to the soil that thus would cause compaction. But if we had a VF tire only at 12, we reduce that significantly to 240 pounds of, of load being applied to that field. But remember, this is only the load to be applied to the material and depending on the, as we said, the soil type, density and moisture will thus the actual compaction be. But it does give you an indication all of a sudden, if you know the field size, the width, uh, what PSI you've got in, what loading you're actually going to put on that field or potential loading or damage that you are going to inflict on the field. There is actually um, 
a little bit of software that we have that we can put all these parameters in and it does give you a guide i think if you can see down there we're using seven tens here a standard one at 20 one at 19 just a reduction of one psi and you can see there's a significant uh, reduction in load being applied but then when you go to vf with that benefit again a significant drop there so all of a sudden we do have a value that we can put on that's going to cause soil compaction to a lesser or great degree what the what the loading is going to be from the tractor onto the uh, onto the soil so that's just an indicator that you might want to think about later on a lot of people dealers and your good sales ask us i've got two tires here steve what's got the biggest footprint what's the biggest surface area and you can fully understand why you're asking that uh, you want to know what's going to walk lighter on the ground between a or b just um, be mindful there there are two um, values that's uh, put in some of the textbooks is a flat plate one where that's just purely the tread hitting the concrete as you were as if it was on the road and that's not necessary in the field the surface area where you would have a, a data called a three inch penetration would you believe which would give you actual the surface area if the tire sank in three inches as it would naturally be in the soil so really you're asking the right question but what i would say to your good selves is what you really want to be asking rather than which has the biggest surface area just say which has the lowest operating pressure so i've got a and b tire they're both carrying three four five ton or whatever both the same weight which is going to operate at the lowest pressure and that with the one in theory with the lowest pressure is the one with the biggest surface area or the biggest footprint We'll go on now to uh, pressure management. This is a little bit more boring and tedious, but it's highly important for us and for your good self. If you want the best life out of your tyre and also the best performance out of the tyre and the tractor. All tyres are pressure sensitive and therefore in order to get this best possible experience that we keep talking about, pressures and pressure settings should be fully understood by your good selves in order for you to enjoy that experience. Just as a matter of interest, standard tyres, 85 series, 70, 65 series, generally have an operating range between 8 PSI and up to 23 PSI. So as you can see there, it's quite a narrow operating window of 15 PSI. We do have, of course, more specialist tyres like your row crop, your telehandler and extra large tyres. That can go up to 58, 60 PSI uh, range that we have. But just an indication there, if you're on a standard tyre, I would suggest if you're running more than 23 PSI, maybe you just want to confirm that with the manufacturer's data book that you are running at the right pressure and not overinflated. Got an um, image, if you like, here, cross section of tyres in terms of correct pressure and incorrect pressure. As you can see on the left hand side, you've got the correct pressure. It's a nice flat footprint in contact with the concrete, the tarmac. You've got good stability, you've got good braking, you've got good even wear. As you're going along and on the other side incorrect and this is one that's overinflated. we're actually stretching the carcass of the tire and we're making it roundified at the bottom as you can see we've got low contact point instability there and also there's a chance of irregular wear because we're riding in the center of the tire but also we could have a bumpy ride as well because there's no give in the tire and remember a tire is the first shock absorber before you go onto your front axle suspension your cab suspension and also your air seat this diagram here or this imagery here is of a, a pressure plate with a 710-7042. Um, we've got the pressure up to 2.6 on the left hand side, in the middle 1.4 and the correct pressure is it should have been 0 0.8. And as you can see from the imagery, the one on the higher pressure, because we're stretching the carcass, we've got very little footprint actually showing. And where we have in the center line of the tire, we've got high pressure points identified in yellow and red. And then when we go into the middle, we've got a little bit more footprint. And as you can see in the right profile of tire at 0 0.8 on the right hand side, we've got a nice big surface area in contact with the concrete and all the edges all the, uh, of the tire are showing as well. And that's how the tire is designed to operate. So just a, a little um, imagery there. And then if we go into soft soil now, again, on the left hand side, correct footprint, nice flat and shallow. So we're not making heavy wheelings. We've got good traction throughout and we'll have good tire life and good good reliability on the other side again we're over inflated we're stretching that tire and as you can see in order to support the weight of the tractor we're having to go further down into the sub base and because of that we're forming if you look at it a gully 
and if we can get soil runoff, if it rains with soil erosion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's absolutely marvellous for that type of thing. If that's what you want to uh, establish, and clearly we don't. So that's some of the pitfalls of, of over of overinflated, incorrect pressure and correct pressure. Tire pressure management is really important here. Tire pressures, I know they're probably a bit of a pain, but they are simple and quick uh, and cheap to do, to adjust. No more time than what you would when you're greasing your tractor, but they will transform the performance of your tractor. Even just two or four PSI would significantly uh, um, adjust the, uh, transform rather, the performance or the output of your tractor. Okay, then. When you bear me. Stephen, we've got yeah. a question coming in there. So, do we know how many PSI is damaging to the soil? Is there a pressure that should, people should be aiming for? Uh, the only pressure that we can aim for is the lowest pressure. Obviously, clearly, the lower the pressure, the less um, soil compaction we're going to be generated. In, in, as I saw on one of the slides earlier on, standard tyres, the lowest operating pressure we're going to go is 8 PSI. Some of the um, extra load tyres, which are also a radial drive tyre, but there's probably go up the scale a little bit more, they would probably be at a minimum of 8. So probably, depending on the manufacturer specifications, you would be limited to around about 8 PSI would be the lowest working pressure. I think if I, if I came in there as well, I think the the support the capacity for soil to support weight and tractor weight it will be hugely dependent on your cultivation style and the moisture in in the soil and that's why many of us have to wait it for the spring and it's been a horrible wet winter and you know you just had to wait and wait and wait because the soil just simply wasn't able to carry any weight yeah. even walking yeah. on it earlier earlier in the year was was arduous so it's hugely dependent on on soil moisture but it's yeah, it's 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 the, the the lightest machine you can get away with, and and the lowest pressure. Yeah, yeah, good. And as I've just got in there, remember, pressures are the only element that you can adjust once you've got your load and you've got your operating speed. The pressure is the only thing that you can adjust in that regard. Um, yeah. Pressure and data books. This is the interesting one. There's three elements to knowing pressures. Um, or normally we want to find out the pressure, but there's a pressure element. There's a speed element that we normally know of, and also there's a load which generally we know of as well. If we know two of those, we can generally find the, the third one. And generally speaking, we know the speed, we know the load, what pressure do I put in my tyre? And again, we'll just fall back to the data sheet here. And as you can see in red, I know it's a VF tyre because it's got that in front, 710742. Looks something daunting if you're not already familiar with it. But if we break it down, um, here on the left-hand side, that's the specification of the tyre itself and the rim that it will go on. We've probably already got that already, so don't forget about that. This is really the heart of the calculation of finding out what pressures do I run at speed versus load. And as I said, it was three elements. Down highlighted here, we've got zero up to 50 kilometers, and then 65 and 70. The next one is kilos, and it's always per tire. Every manufacturer, when we're talking about load, it's per tire. So if you go over a weigh bridge and she's 10 ton, we're talking about five tons. Yeah, just a key, key note to remember. And then on the top, most people are in bar. I'm still an old PSI man, but that will be it. So like I say, we've got speed, the load it's carrying, and therefore we gain the pressure. So it's fairly simple um, to find out exactly what pressure you should be getting at any given load and any given speed. And that's the chart again there. But how do we find these pressure charts? Well, there's a number of ways we can go about. You can talk to your friendly uh, tire um, tire dealer and he'll probably be able to supply you with some. You can go onto the internet and on most manufacturers, you can download the file there. Or what most of us are doing now, we have these things, that we, as you know, called apps. Bridgestone, along with everyone else, we have a free download app, and then you go into that there, find out the specific tire that you're talking about, click on that, and then you go down, as you can see there on the um, left-hand side, you can go to the weight, which in this case is just over four ton per tire, and then across the top as you move across, depending on your speed, will give you your pressure. There's a number of other elements to it as well if you click on that, and you can also, with the pressure chart, actually uh, share that with other people. So quite a nice bit of kit, as all these are from other manufacturers, but that's an easy and simple simple way, keep it in your pocket rather than at the workshop um, and you can go forward from there.
Remember, when we're giving these pressure readings, yeah, they're always given and always taken when the tyre is cold, when the tyre's ambient temperature. Because remember, if you do work that tyre, it generates heat. The heat increases the temperature of the air within the tyre, and by in turn, that increases the temperature of the air within the sorry, the pressure of the air within the tyre. And just another one at the bottom: always, always use a correct gauge where possible. Cross-reference, if you've got three or four in the farm, cross-reference every now and again. And as long as they're within, say, one PSI of the other, continue to use it. I do remember going on one farm one time between technical, myself and the farmer. There was an eight PSI difference between three gauges. Coming on now to the, towards the end, and this is the importance of a balanced tractor in conjunction with having the right pressure, a balanced tractor in terms of weight, etc. And what we're looking for here is a balanced tractor in terms of the load distribution, the power distribution, and the footprint distribution in order for you to get maximum traction, reduce wheel slip, uh, reduce fuel consumption, uh, less wear, increased productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a balance between those front and rear of the axle. And that's what we're trying to depict here. Pro rata to the size of the tire, we want equal load for equal power for equal square inch so that the front tires are doing the correct amount of work rather than the owners all being on the back or vice versa. This is a quick weight distribution chart. It's an American one. Most of our tractors mechanical front wheel drive and uh, that would be normally a four-wheel drive with our good selves the american four-wheel drive that's equal tires front and rear and the vast majority i would think of operations in uk would be a, a mechanical four-wheel drive four-wheel drive tractor fully mounted and the, generally speaking you'd be looking in work in four-wheel drive a weight distribution there of 40 percent on the front 60 on the back this can change slightly so as it says at the bottom always consult your tractor model for your, uh, your dealer and see if that does change i know some of the american tractors coming over a little bit more front end heavy but that's what we'll be looking for and this is an example of what not to do those that are keen eyed there will see that it's not actually in work but it just shows you what we're trying to illustrate here by not doing whereas all the work weight is on the rear of the uh, the rear axle and that's anchored to the ground with very little uh, movement available to it taking all the power whereas the front axle as you can see there is just skipping along front axle does 40 percent of the work that's why you bought a four-wheel drive tractor so it should engage uh, to that level it's sometimes quite difficult static loads and dynamic loadings to see whether you're running correctly with it uh, but one of the things i think you can do from a distance and you'll all know if you see the tractor when it's up to speed is it running parallel to the ground or is it sitting up and beg or is it nodding its head at the front and generally if it's level with the ground and going along generally speaking your weight distribution is correct for front to rear this is just a slide here just showing where a chap's working away and diligently and he's put a weight on the back to give this counterbalance as we know there's various weight blocks that you can put on the front now the alt slabs the um these um, tool carriers that wrap around two two ton etc etc with your name uh, lasered on the front and you've got the old suitcase weights there which were quite good to fine tune do remember if you're putting weight on the front because you're putting weight beyond the front of the center uh, the, the front fulcrum you'll actually be taking weight from the back i do know with a john deere if you put a 900 kilo on the front you'll actually be transferring half a ton from the back so your six ton plow becomes actually a five and a half ton plow so just be mindful of that if you are fine tuning you will get a weight transfer of mass to the front when you're going in this configuration weight over the front of the front fulcrum rear cast weights inboard and outboard um, these are generally if you want traction as the weight is distributed equally either side of the fulcrum so there's very little transfer of weight front to rear but it's mainly used if you want to bite heavily into the ground to gain traction just a quick one that we did here an example uh, last year we had a 160 horsepower tractor four meter cultivator and we had the option to either put front weight on or not and just as a course we set it all up and we did one pass as you can see that after we'd set it all up uh, and without the weight on and we generated 33 percent wheel slip and simply all we did was then apply the 900 kilo weight to the front and did the self same exercise again and reduce that slip down to one uh, 13 percent 22 percent reduction and the only thing we did was put weight over the front end and that meant that that front axle then was doing meaningful work and came more in balance 
not only we did reduce reduce the slip but also we reduced the fuel usage and also the time uh, to complete the pass simply by having the correct weight distribution so like i say it's a footprint and also weight distribution for a balanced tractor this is just a nice couple of photographs that uh, illustrate this. Um, we've got two tractors the same, two, I think, four-metre coon cultivators that they had up in the Scottish borders last year when they're doing some optimization training there. One is optimised on the left-hand side at 10 PSI all the way around. You can't see it, but I was led to believe they had weights in the uh, in the um, centres on the rear, so it was balanced as well. And on the um, left right-hand side, 25 uh, PSI, no one had bothered checking it, it just come off the wagon, as you can see between the two, as the left hand one that's optimised goes into deflection as it comes out, there's a lot more movement, and by having a greater movement you can break that soil away, as opposed to the uh, right one that can't. You can clear, clearly see there on the front as well, same field, same time, that they're not with having no self-cleaning because we're not getting that deflection because the, the carcass is roundified if you like, we are just building up and building up and building up, whereas the optimised tyre is going forward with nice clean bite when it goes into its next anchor point. And if you look on the back, walking lightly over the land, as we like to say, the optimised one, as you can see there, is walking very, very nicely, where the non-optimised one is um, obviously a high slip, panning the soil out, doing everything wrong and not going anywhere very quickly. And again, that's just a case of having the weight distribution correctly and also the footprint correct. So finally, to summarise, we would say that you guys want to have the benefits for your good self and the farm of less soil compaction, less load, pounds per square inch, applied to your land, improved traction, less wheel slip, reduced fuel usage, improved productivity in terms of man hours, greater tyre life that we're all striving to achieve, better ride comfort, lower operating costs, and obviously greater profitability. And if you want those, I would suggest, A, you want to observe correct tyre choice, be aware of what the choices are out there, talk to the manufacturers and get the right choice for your specific application. Always be aware of latest technologies, generation four, just around the corner. Have a look out for that if that's applicable to the um, task in hand. Maintain correct operating pressure and your weight distribution. And wherever possible, if you can just think back, look for the lowest PSI in every square inch and where possible, if you can reduce that width down from 25 inch, 25 inches to 24 to maybe 23, you will uh, reduce the impact of soil compaction on your soil. And that's me. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much, Stephen. That's uh, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm amazed you've been able to keep it within uh, within the hour. Uh, I know ah, yes. I'm just looking now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 uh, fantastic. So we have got some um, uh, time for questions, which is, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to bring in Michelle Nuttall, who is our re regional manager from the northwest of England. And she'll she'll um, she'll ask some questions to us both. Brilliant. So the first thing is probably just a little bit of clarification, if that's okay, Stephen. Quite close to the beginning, um, you showed the different um, shapes of the different tyres um, as if they're in contact with the ground, showing... Yeah, um, um, the footprint, yeah. The footprint, exactly. Um, they, they looked slightly bigger as you went across the screen. That's not the case. It was just... Um, no, the actual the actual width should be maybe it's within the PowerPoint or the screen itself that's elongated it. But no, all those were meant to represent 650 width. Yeah. So if it if it did seem that, I apologise. But all those width wise, as where the lines came with the arrows, that was 650 width. So the width of the tire was was the same for all of them. It's just the shape within that, whether it extended front and rear, which I was trying to achieve and show you. Brilliant. Okay. So. Um, if you're selecting new tyres, if you're putting a drill tractor on weigh cells and working out that it will carry at weight and speed of my trailed no-till disc drill at 8 psi on a standard tyre, is it right to assume I wouldn't benefit from spending the extra on IF or VF tyres over standard? Um, if end of the day the standard generation one was 8 psi for the load carrying, then yes, because you are limited on a, on a generation three as well to 8 psi, there would be no gain. Brilliant. Setting the pressure the according. Brilliant. Setting the pressure Sorry. according to the load you're carrying is simple enough for a mounted implement. 
which works above the ground, but how would you measure the load applied um, by a plough when in work, for example? All right. This, yes, this is always a difficult one. What we do is the uh, static loading with the tyre, uh, with the waste cell just onto the tyre. But actually, I think what the um, uh, audience member is trying to say is the dynamic loading, what load is actually applied when you've got some resistance to the rear. That is very, very difficult. Some manufacturers do give a factor of half or one or uh, 75 percent more, but it is very, very difficult to um, establish unless you've got sensors underneath uh, and obviously different fields, different moistures within that field of the, the different dynamic loads. So it is really, really difficult for us to put a defined figure on that that's constant throughout the field and one that each time you go back into that field you could do. So most manufacturers just do static loading. So um, you talked about the temperature change um, affecting tyre pressures. So based on the temperature difference notice, noted, should tyre pressures be the same in summer and winter? Does the flexibility of the tyres alter greatly based on the time of year also? There will be, uh, depending on the pressure differential, yes, the, the potential will be. Um, we do, as manufacturers, we do factor it in from an ambient temperature to what it would be up to its working pressure and to get the cross-sectional profile of the tyre as we want to be. It's, non, it's optimal cross-sectional profile, so there will be that. And certainly I do know in cases where we've had uh, maybe a fast track under a heavy loads, uh, slurry tankers coming back um, 15k down the road and coming back in we ha I have noticed at times there's been a pressure increase of around about eight to nine psi but that was quite a severe um, application but it is factored into the uh, to the formula that when it gets up to operating pressure there is an increase and therefore the profile will be correct at the time of work Great. And then I'll only ask one more. Um, just I'm aware that we're coming up to our hour. But, um, yeah. What I will do is I will send these questions that are slightly more specific on to Harry and Stephen and they'll get back to people that have asked the questions directly when it's a specific example. Um, actually, I'll ask two. I'll take it back. So at 0.8 bar, aren't you running the risk of rim slip when heavy pulling if you're subsoiling, for example? Um, and in the example they ended up increasing to just over one bar is that common should that be something they think about right well the first point in terms of the lower pressure at uh, zero zero point eight bar for heavy draft work no in terms of a vf tire and i think to be fair in terms of generation one two and three but specifically if we're talking about generation three here those tires are designed to have no slippage so under that load and, and providing that the tire size is specified by the manufacturer so yes you can fit a 710 7042 our tires along with other manufacturers at that lower pressure with that loading on it will be it won't be a problem rim slippage rim slippage tends to be a thing of the past the engineering and the tolerances that can go in there and plus the the new designs on knurlings etc is really um, rim slippage should be very much a thing of the past the latest technology tires are built with that in mind between the horsepower and also the draft being applied around that bead area okay and the and second that's... sorry the second one sorry. michelle sorry sorry michelle the second part of the question was was what sorry um i think it was all in i think it was just that bit that you answered all right sorry and then the last one is what are the price differentials in tire types and can you give us a clue of what generation four might offer <laughs> right okay in terms we, all, we always get what's the uh, we were offering you 40 percent benefit and i quite like this um what does it cost us well it's not 40 percent more from a standard tire um depending on whether there's a promotion at the time from different manufacturers throughout the year cashbacks these sorts of things um by and large i would say from a generation one tire of the same size to a generation three a vf tire you're probably looking around about 10 15 percent differential so quite when you look about what it, when you look at them figures that you can eradicate uh, potentially of soil compaction from your field, that extra two, three, four, five hundred pounds or whatever it is is really minimal. But it's around about 10, 15 percent up on a standard generation one tire. Um, in terms of generation four, that's what everyone is working on at the moment to get that bigger footprint. So it's actually still the same width, but obviously 
elongated even more and that's the difficulty that our engineers our our scientists trying to have something that's very much like a track if you like in contact with the ground much more a much more bigger surface area long ways um coming into deflection and then coming out the movement the sheer movement of, of rubber uh, going into deflection into the footprint and then and, and exiting out that's the key that we're trying to overcome and still keep it as a pneumatic tire where we can adjust the pressures accordingly rather than a fixed track if you like but that is coming but the engineers are working on that that's the next generation as we don't want to go wider for gate openings or widths as we talked about that is what we're trying to extend that footprint further to come a little bit more like a track if you like but it is a very hard challenge for the engineers of all manufacturers to work on at the moment with the movement within that tire and still keep the reliability of the tire throughout the life of the tire Okay, um, Stephen, I think that's the, the end of the questions and um, thanks to Michelle for, uh, for fielding the questions um, from, the, from the group. Um, the other questions we'll get, we'll, we'll forward on to myself if it's relevant for me or for, uh, for Stephen more likely and, uh, and we, can, we can get those covered off uh, in due course. Um, but uh, I have to say thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, that was a, an excellent run through of tyres. I hope um, the audience um, of have uh, I've enjoyed it. If you just nick on to the next slide, uh, Stephen. But of course, we're not actually together. Stephen's in his boudoir in Yorkshire, and I'm in it in my tractor shed. Would you believe? Um, there's a survey on just at the moment. Um, if you can, uh, if you could help us uh, uh, complete the HDB planting and variety survey, that would be very, very good. Um, so look, catch up with that, and that would be great. Next slide again, Stephen, please. And um, go on again. That's it. Survey. We've, if you've got a survey, uh, we've got a survey coming up when you pull out. So just help us shape the, uh, the the future webinars. That would be great. It has been recorded, so you can uh, you can check back on our YouTube channel. Um, questions will be forwarded on. So that's that's great. And the next farming, uh, the next web webinar really is um, farming today. How are you coping? So it's it's. This webinar has been pretty technical. The next webinar will be entirely different, and it's uh, it's a little bit more about yourself. It's a little bit more about sitting back and reflecting. Are you coping? Are you coping with uh, with a uh, a wet winter, coronavirus, a dry spring, um, all those sorts of things? And and can you uh, reach out to someone? Can you talk to somebody? The speakers will be Martin Williams, which you may well have heard of from, from Hereford. He farms in Hereford. And uh, Becky Leach from uh, Kite Consulting. Martin will have a few interesting tales to tell, some humorous, some less so. And, and Becky Leach is really good at, at getting people to, to step back a little bit and, and just take a, a look at yourself and, uh, um, uh, and get you to reflect on the uh, on, on your capacity in, in the in everyday working day. So with that, um, thank you all very much for uh, listening and tuning in. Uh, thank you for Stephen and uh, to giving up his time as well. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>